We will start off the presentation today with Jamie Alberti, the Green Infrastructure Program Director with the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay, who will provide a brief overview of the issues related to stormwater and how green infrastructure can help protect not only your property, but also the water that you depend on for drinking, eating, and bathing, and ultimately the Chesapeake Bay. Then we'll hear firsthand from two homeowners who, has, who have put several green infrastructure practices in place um, in their homes and their experiences in doing so. Just a couple of quick housekeeping items. We welcome your questions throughout the webinar and we are going to answer them at the end of the presentations. There is a Q&A box that's located at the bottom of your screen in which you can type your questions. We, um, we are recording this webinar as you probably just heard and it's gonna be available in approximately 48 hours on our website, chesapeakebay.net, and also on our YouTube page. Uh, you are muted and you're going to be remain so throughout the duration of the presentation. Um, so let me go ahead and turn things over to Jamie. All right, thank you, Rachel. Uh, if you can click over. As Rachel said, uh, I'm with the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. I've been with the Alliance a little over 20 years now. So I have worked in uh, a number of different project areas uh, for the last 13 years. I've worked with a program called River Smart Homes, which is a program of the District Department of Energy and Environment in Washington, DC. Uh, and the program provides incentives to district property owners to install green infrastructure practices um, on their properties. Uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in a few minutes. If you can click over. So uh, starting out with green infrastructure, first thing is first, we need to talk about stormwater. What is stormwater? Simply put, stormwater is the water that falls from the sky and runs across the land. Um, a lot of times you'll see that running into uh, storm drains. Click to the next one. Why do we care about stormwater? Uh, a couple different reasons. First of all, when we have rain events, um, you get a high volume of water and that can cause a lot of erosion. If you take a look at this photo here, um, you know, you can see the extent to which um, stormwater can really play an impact. There's an outfall of a, a storm drain close by um, to where that photo was taken, um, and it really can cause some severe damage. Uh, not only are we dealing with the water itself, but we're also dealing with what that water picks up along the way in its travel. So sediment, oil, pet waste, uh, anything that it, it comes across is going to try to carry with it. So that causes uh, issues with um, you know, contamination of water uh, and, and general overall health. You can click to the next one. I'm sure you've all seen uh, evidence of stormwater uh, in this area, in the DC area. It's about to storm on us, so we're gonna see some pretty soon here. Um, but like I said, you know, overflowing gutters, just that volume of water, you see it um, entering storm drains, carrying with it pollutants. You see like the oil in the bottom right photo, uh, on the left, you see evidence of erosion caused by stormwater running across the land. You can click to the next one. So those of us that live in urban areas, I put uh, just one example here, um, but if you take a look at the photo on the right, this shows the Chesapeake Bay watershed and the, you can kind of see the highlighted areas that have higher impervious surface areas. Uh, impervious surface is um, land areas that water cannot penetrate through. So we're talking about buildings, your homes, driveways, walkways, uh, patios, all of those kind of things um, really exacerbate stormwater issues because it doesn't allow water to infiltrate into the ground and it just picks up speed traveling across the surface. So in this example, Washington, D.C., 43% of the district is impervious. Uh, in one single rain event, a 1.2 inch storm, we're getting roughly 525 million gallons of stormwater runoffs that, you know, something that we need to deal with. You can click to the next one. 
So what can we do about this stormwater? So green infrastructure is an approach to water management that protects, restores, or mimics the natural water cycle. It improves water quality, reduces flooding, increases wildlife habitat, and improves air quality. Um, and these are practices that anyone can install. It can range in complexity from very simple practices to really complex practices. Um, a lot of times you'll hear uh, these practices referred to as best management practices, which is just a technical term that we're using um, you know, for these methods of green infrastructure that we're installing to try to manage stormwater. Get to the next one. Again, we have a large variety of green infrastructure practices here. I'm not going to go into detail on these uh, ones. These are just uh, here so you can see some of the larger scale efforts. Um, that are available uh, to help not only manage the stormwater that's coming across the land, but also uh, the erosion that's occurring from the other side, from the coast, the wave action and wind action that's eroding from the other side as well. So um, you can see the list here. These are some larger scale practices. The photos here are practices that the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay has uh, installed in the last few years. Um, so they're out there. If you can flick to the next one, we're really gonna concentrate more on these smaller scale practices, things that you can do at your home, on your properties to help manage stormwater. Um, first thing, that you, really one of the easiest things that you all can do um, is conservation landscaping. Um, you'll also hear it heard of as basecaping. This really simply put is using native plants in your landscaping. So replacing um, lawn or you know, any um, existing plants, hard surfaces that you have with natives. Um, it provides a lot of benefits we'll talk about in just a second. Rain gardens are a really good way to capture stormwater, temporarily hold it and then allow it to slowly infiltrate into the ground. So this is more of a, a designed garden where you dig out, usually about two feet down, replace that soil with a bioretention soil mix, which is uh, a mix that's designed to allow that water to infiltrate into the ground a little better. Um, and those of you that live in, in areas with a lot of clay content, rocky soil, um, you, you, know, uh, you know from just looking at your property how water can sit. So um, you know, this is usually capturing water from a downspout, collecting it um, usually up to, to 48 hours and allowing that water to slowly infiltrate, um, also using native plants in its design. Uh, rain barrel, you can see one in the photo on the right, um, but you know, it's kind of hidden back there. Um, essentially, we're just capturing stormwater right from the downspout, uh, collecting it in that barrel. That barrel, I believe, holds 132 gallons of water, and that water can then be used to water plants later, wash your car, whatever you want to use it for. So capturing it first and then using it later. Um, so dispersing the, the time um, to, to release that water. Permeable pavers, you can see them in the bottom of that photo. Uh, again, you know, capturing stormwater in those joints between the pavers rather than uh, letting it run across the surface. Um, so we're, we're capturing and infiltrating water with that system. Shade trees, I don't have a photo on here, but shade trees are great uh, in stabilizing soil. Their root systems are really great at doing that and uptake of water. They're also really good um, with helping out with energy bills as well. Um, green roofs, uh, Liz will talk about this uh, a little bit more, um, but essentially we're taking some of that impervious surface off of the top of buildings um, and replacing that with gardens, um, allowing more infiltration of water. Same thing with infiltration trenches and dry wells. Um, that's just a, a really simple practice that is capturing water uh, in the ground rather than allowing it to run off um, and infiltrating that into the ground. You can click to the next one. All right, so I mentioned native plants. Um, native plants really provide a lot of benefits. Um, not only um, you know, clean air and water, but it supports wildlife. Um, and you know, 
really can save you a lot of, of effort in, in maintenance um, when done correctly. So what do I mean by native plants? Those are plants um, that were originally found in this area before colonization. So they're adapted to the climate, the conditions of the area, the pests of the area, um, and, and really they're just low, lower maintenance options. Um, you can see some of the benefits listed here, um, but I'm gonna draw your attention to the image on the right side. You can see a comparison of some of the non-native plants versus native plants, um, and take a look at those root systems. Native plants are really, really great at stabilizing soils and uptake of water. Those are, are the big ticket items. They also have you know, the other benefits listed here. Um, once they're established, really they're, they're much easier to take care of. Um, no fertilizer, no pesticides really needed. Um, and they do support wildlife, especially pollinators, which are so important. Um, you can flick to the next one. Like I mentioned before, um, I have been working with the River Smart Homes program for the past 13 years, and you'll hear from two homeowners who have participated in this program um, and installed some really great green infrastructure practices. Um, again, the goals of this program really align with what we're trying to do with green infrastructure in general. Really, as I mentioned, reducing that quantity of water, that high volume, improving the quality, getting pollutants and nutrients uh, out of the, the waterways, recharging groundwater, increasing habitat, um, water conservation. And, and one really great uh, thing about these incentive programs, and there, are, you know, this one is Washington, D.C., but there are many throughout the watershed. Um, it really encourages the community to get involved and participate, um, you know, using their own properties to help manage stormwater. You can flick to the next one. Okay, so what are we looking for? Uh, just really quickly, um, in, in looking at your own property, how do you evaluate it to determine what may be possible to put on your property, what green infrastructure practices? So really the key is looking at um, water flow and how can we intercept that water? That's, that's the biggest um, thing that we're looking for in evaluating properties. So we're looking at you know, just how the water is flowing on the property, where the downspouts are, how much water is draining to those downspouts, what is the, the size of the roof that's draining there, what structures are on the property that we need to take into consideration, impervious surfaces like walkways. Um, we need to pay attention to where the foundation and retaining walls are um, to keep water away from those areas. We're looking at slopes, how water is traveling, um, you know, where large trees are. We don't want to damage any critical root zone around trees. Um, and then thinking ahead about if I install a practice in a certain area, um, you know, what's the maintenance gonna look like? How am I gonna water a garden? Um, am I gonna want that area for a dog or entertaining? So kind of thinking through and planning out projects ahead of time is really helpful uh, in making them successful. Can flick to the next one. And just, I'm gonna finish up with just a few examples of projects that were installed through the River Smart Homes program in Washington, DC. These are all residential properties. Um, rain barrels, again, a simple practice, very easy to install, helps capture water um, you know, during that storm event, and then you can use it and slowly release that water over time to spread out um, the infiltration. In the center, you see a combined rain garden basecape. And again, you know, you can start with one practice. You can continually add on practices, um, you know, to, to really address any stormwater concerns. Um, a lot of times we'll do a rain barrel, which overflows into a rain garden, which may overflow into a basecape, um, and it just handles that much more water. Again, on the right side, um, when practices are first installed, you know, you're, it, it's not going to be this full uh, garden that you're envisioning. Um, you know, the, the plants need time to grow and fill in. 
Um, but you can see, you know, the installation photo and then after about a year, you know, that those plants have filled in and are really going to be doing a good job of capturing stormwater. Um, again, bottom left, a mature basecape there. Uh, and then another example in the center of a permeable paper project. Um, again, that's capturing a lot of water. The downspout is run into that practice uh, and capturing water that way. So it's not running out into an alleyway or street, whatever is connected there. Okay, so I am going to now uh, turn it over to my colleague, Jordan Bokenauer, uh, and he's gonna introduce our stars of the show, our, our homeowners today. So Jordan, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Jamie. So I'm Jordan Gokenauer. Um, I'm the DC Green Infrastructure Projects Associate um, for the Alliance for the Chesapeake Bay. So basically I spend most of my time working with homeowners and contractors who are looking to install landscaping practices through the River Smart Homes program. Um, so I've had the pleasure of working with our next two speakers, uh, Joey Abrams and Liz Crawford. Um, so we're gonna start with Joey. And this is a really cool example of how Joey was able to use uh, these landscaping practices to treat a whole lot of water. Um, so I'm going to hand it off to Joey to tell us about his, his uh, property. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Joey Abrams. Um, my wife and I moved into the Woodbridge, Wood Ridge uh, neighborhood of Northeast DC in uh, basically January of 2016. And one of the most attractive things about the property um, was the size of the lot. Uh, it's about 45 feet wide, which isn't much, but it's 190 feet from the street to the uh, alley in the back. And it was essentially a blank canvas, uh, nothing but, um, you know, uh, remnants of some old landscaping, but primarily, um, you know, we're talking crabgrass and, you know, some weeds. Um, and so I saw it as an opportunity and, you know, it was definitely a big reason why we uh, decided to purchase the property. And then upon moving in, I realized that the scale of this is, um, uh, you know, quite, quite large uh, to undertake something like this. Um, and, you know, I think we, we also uh, had heard through the grapevines, we'd seen rain barrels around the neighborhood and knew that there were some program in, uh, programs in place uh, through the city that could help us uh, kind of uh, manage stormwater as well as uh, do some, some landscaping. Um, so pretty shortly after moving in when spring rain started, uh, you know, we kind of realized that uh, the water, as you can see from this picture, the backyard kind of slopes down into the northeast. Um, you're looking south in this picture. Um, and, you know, these kind of gullies would form and you could tell that there was really high turbidity, lots of, you know, suspended um, particulates, uh, dirt and silt in the water that was running off. Um, as you can see, there's no large plants or any native species here that are really holding uh, the yard together. So in, in part, you know, there's the environmental aspect, but we were certainly concerned about our property washing away um, uh, and of no consequence, or, or certainly not of, of little consequence was the fact that I was building the shed with footings that, you know, would very easily kind of be undermined if, if the, you know, erosion started to, to get really bad. Um, so we realized that we had an opportunity um, based on our downspouts. We don't have a lot of impervious surface, but we certainly do have a slope that uh, contributes to runoff. And like I said, with the square footage of the property, a lot of um, you know uh, water that we could capture. Um, so you know, in terms of kind of finding out about what the options were, the city actually makes it quite easy to uh, find out what's what's out there and we got connected with uh, the River Smart uh, Homes program. And you know, there's a form and essentially when you fill out this form, there's some things that's required for you to do. And this is gonna be the case throughout, you know, any program that you might find in the, um, you know, bay, in the Chesapeake Bay uh, drainage basin. Um, and that is first and foremost, you have to see how much, you know, water your, your property can hold. And that's usually 
done in part through a perk test, which is where you dig essentially uh, an eight to 10 inch hole, a couple of feet deep, I think, and you fill it with water with your garden hose and you take measurements every couple of minutes or so. And, and uh, the form gives specifics on that, but you basically get a metric for how much uh, water uh, it drains. And that will, you know, guide the uh, audit process in terms of determining how big of a, a rain garden you would need to capture that. And in addition, part of the audit is, you know, they have someone come out and inspect your property. And um, as you can kind of see from these drawings, this is, you know, essentially what uh, I was able to, you know, come up with, with the um, uh, contracting firm that was contracted by, by the city. And they do, they work great with you. They ask you what you want, what your vision was. Um, they come and look at where your downspouts are and kind of offer you some proposals. So a lot of the things uh, that we took advantage of uh, almost run the full gamut of things that are available to folks. Um, we have a number of rain barrels, we have base gaping, we have rain gardens. Um, so, uh, and you know, and we and we put in a, a three trees as a matter of fact. So um, we we really kind of jumped in, uh, you know, uh, jumped in the deep end with this project pretty quickly. So the first thing that came up as rain garden number one in the base scape. Um, we didn't really have plans for rain garden number two after rain garden number one in base scape. We, we really were like, oh, this is just fantastic. Um, and as you can see, the downspouts from our house he drain directly into the upper rain garden and anything that kind of falls on the ground and starts sloping down that hill towards the alley is generally caught by uh, the base scaping. Um, but in addition to that, we had rain barrels for the other side of the house. And uh, later on, you'll see a picture of one of these. And, you know, essentially I have a quick connect that connects to a hose. And in really, really dry times, that hose runs subsurface over to a series of uh, irrigation tubing that actually waters the base scaping in times when it's really dry and uh, some of the plants in the base scaping start to wilt a little bit. So, you know, we've got it all kind of tied in together uh, and interconnected. Um, and it's, you know, essentially, uh, you know, takes care of itself for the most part. Um, so, you know, hopefully some folks will have questions about maintenance later, but um, I'll say right now that it's certainly decreased you know, how much I have to mow. And it's certainly, um, you know, decreased uh, weeding because a lot of these things now mature have just absolutely shaded out um, a lot of the invasives and, uh, you know, weedy uh, creatures that, uh, you know, would otherwise be growing in the lawn. Um, so, yeah, and you can stay on this slide. Uh, rain garden number two came out, and I think this is a perfect transition because we realized, as you can see, the base gaming is pretty mature here. This is probably two years in. Um, we still notice like we have these big gullies and you know a lot of muddy you know kind of uh, stagnant water at uh, different places in the backyard even with the slope and you know these gullies are still forming and as it turns out the neighbor to our west who we love um, does have a giant poured concrete patio and they love to have barbecues and parties and we are not the type of neighbors to go um, you know knocking on folks door and telling them to rip up um, their party platform um, but we certainly were going to be proactive about the problem. Um, and kind of fortunately, all of the water from their roof, uh, front and back with the way their home is built, goes through their gutters and downspouts onto this patio and actually enters our property at the place you see in the picture in the left. Um, almost all of that water comes in right at that, at that juncture. So I simply installed a, a channel grate. Um, it's about you know, two to three feet long. Um, runs perpendicular to uh, the length of my property, um, right up against this fence line. And as you can see with the corrugated tubing that's running down, this is the precursor to rain garden number two that you saw on the previous slide. Um, here we found and calculated based on the runoff from the roof of their home and the runoff from the patio itself collectively um, captures about 1600 gallons of water per one inch of rain. Um, and that's not counting the water that also enters that rain garden from, you know, running off the top of my shed and just from anywhere in that upper section of the yard that doesn't go into the upper rain garden. Um, so, you know, this was a great opportunity where in the first garden, we took advantage of the uh, grant program. Um, and this is taken a few days ago. This is what 
four years of a, a raid garden um, maturation can look like. You see the Joe pie and the yellow cones are towering over my head. Those uh, Joe pie are probably close to 12 to 14 feet high. Um, there's mallow in there, you know, the um, hibiscus, and it is a wonderland for our kids um, and the neighbor's kids for that matter. Um, and this was done through the uh, grant program and as was the basecaping, um, which essentially meant that, you know, for the size of the rain garden, a certain amount of money was put up by uh, the city and, you know, we took care of the rest. And I think for garden number one in the basecape, um, you know, if I can hazard a guess, I think we probably came out of pocket, you know, around a hundred dollars for all of that. Um, so certainly cost effective, cost efficient, um, beautification, environmental impacts, all of these things all wrapped up into one and uh, we couldn't have been more happy with it. So moving on to rain garden number two, this is basically a picture of what it looks like when we get about an inch to an inch and a half of rain. Um, it fills up, occasionally overflows, but rarely, um, and in makes a nice little pond. And the contractor we worked with um, that Jordan was actually uh, once, uh, well, when he built this garden for us, um, a member of uh, put in this really beautiful little waterfall feature. So that corrugated tubing that you saw in earlier uh, runs out underneath that down a few um, pieces of slate or you know slab rock um, and looks like a natural waterfall during these events. It's quite beautiful and uh, we absolutely love it. So, um, you know, again, there's the environmental aspect, there's the property um, damage that it avoids uh, through preventing, you know, essentially our yard washing away. Um, everything in our yard when it gets into the alley ends up going into Hickey Run which goes through the Arboretum and directly into the Anacostia. We are not far from that whatsoever. Um, so we know exactly the impacts we're having and, and where it can be felt. Um, so moving on to the rain barrels, again, these are, we have three of them. I think we did rebate and grant for some of these. So we took advantage of those uh, opportunities, um, both coming and going, whichever way we get them. And in this case, I think these are the um, rebate ones because we found these and purchased them ourselves. Um, uh, the grant ones that they bring out themselves are certainly wonderful. And we have one in the front of the house. The one in the front of the house actually feeds a wildflower, native wildflower garden that uh, isn't pictured in the slides. Um, but one of the beautiful things about this is that it really goads you into thinking more broadly about what you can do with parts of your property beyond, you know, the initial installation. Um, so, you know, that kind of automatic irrigation factor um, that we use for the front rain barrel uh, is tied in with all of these rain barrels as well. So whenever we have a dry spell, you know, I just hook up the quick connect, turn the spigot on, and it automatically goes through the irrigation tubing and waters um, all of these additional projects that I've put in. Um, we obviously use it, as you can see from the watering can, to water our vegetables and tomatoes uh, in the summertime too. Rainwater, as most know, is much more beneficial for growing plants because of all the um, organic matter that is caught in there versus, you know, watering with, um, you know, chlorinated chloramine tap water. Um, so, you know, essentially any water that goes into our yard for any purpose is all uh, caught naturally. So um, this is a picture from, I think, last summer. And um, the thing that we love to do whenever uh, we see a big storm uh, coming is put on our boots and get our umbrellas out and go splash around in our uh, temporary pond. Um, it's a wonderful opportunity for young kids. Uh, we do you know, identification of different bugs uh, that live in the gardens, uh, the different plants, uh, the kids play hide and go seek. It's, you know, a natural wonderland for them. Um, and I think all in all, it has been, you know, a pride for me to take care of. Um, and like I said, the, the maintenance is, is pretty minimal. Um, apart from every spring, just taking advantage of some of the native nurseries in the area, uh, and going out and buying a few things to fill in gaps, it's really set it and forget it. It was minor weeding and occasionally uh, mulching some areas that become bare. Uh, but for the most part, uh, starting in March, it comes back every year bigger and fuller than it did in uh, previous years. 
So I appreciate the opportunity to share this with you. I, I hope that anybody who gets to take advantage of this will have a similar experience. Um, it really is a such a motivating factor to get out in your yard um, and to see it grow and develop is, is truly a sense of pride. And I couldn't be more appreciative of uh, the you know, every organization that's involved in this from city government up through the nonprofits that uh, brought us to this point. So I hope to answer some questions later, but I, uh, unless Jordan has some things he'd like to bring up now, I think I'm, I'm done. We can move on to our next, our next presenter. Thanks, Joey. Yeah, we'll, uh, we'll get some more questions after, uh, after Liz is done here. But for now, I want to introduce uh, Liz Crawford. Um, she's another homeowner who I've been able to work with through the River Smart Homes program. Um, also has a beautiful property full of uh, landscaping and other green infrastructure practices. So I'm gonna turn it over to you, Liz. All right, thank you, Jordan. Thanks very much for the opportunity to um, talk a little bit about my yard and the transformations that have happened um, as a result or in part because of the River Smart program and with help from the Alliance. Um, I live in the uh, Shepherd Park neighborhood of Washington, DC, and um, we moved there in 2014. And uh, my front of my house um, was bare grass at the time. Um, you can see it isn't right now. And you can probably get a sense of why my neighbor who lives across the street and looks at it every day gave me the mug that says plant lady. I've become uh, something of a native plant advocate since we moved here from Anchorage, Alaska. And um, I'm always looking for opportunities to improve habitat for wildlife in my yard. Um, shortly after we moved in, there was a huge thunderstorm that brought untold quantities of water to my property and the neighborhood. And that's when I first became aware of the importance of storm water and how living in a city with lots of houses close together and half of the city being impermeable can create real runoff problems um, for, for everyone, for people, for the, for the city infrastructure and for wildlife and pollution, we live less than half a mile from Rock Creek Park and that water that rushes down the alley behind my house and dumps directly into Rock Creek um, is bringing considerable pollution um, to the creek. So I felt early on it was very important to try to address that. Um, I first learned about um, the grain barrel rebate program um, not too long after we moved in and I took advantage of it and installed two rain barrels at the front of my house and then used the spigots at the bottom to divert the water to various gardening beds. Um, and it's been very successful. I even managed to divert my air conditioner uh, condenser water into one of the rain barrels. So I'm able to effectively use that water to water my yard as well. And later on um, in this last year, we've added two more rain barrels. So we feel that we're at least able to capture a small, it seems like a drop in the bucket, sorry about the pun, compared to the one point, the 500 million gallons of a, of a one inch an hour, of one inch of rain from a storm, but still it's something and it, it's helpful. Um, all right, let's go to the next slide. When we first moved in, this is what our backyard looked like. And our property is on a slope that's fairly steep. Um, we had an old some impervious cement driveway and my husband was very unhappy because the little tiny garage couldn't even hold his motorcycle once his tools were unpacked in there. So we had a desire for a two car garage and I was reluctant to dig up any space and, and take away any yard space. But at the same time, I, I recognized the problem. And after we thought about it for a while, we realized that the best place to put the garage would be where the fenced in swampy backyard was. And I realized that perhaps someday the top of that garage could be a surface adjacent to my main story that was um, somehow a garden or patio or green roof type structure. And then the area on the right side of the driveway seemed to me to have some potential for a garden. And I then came to learn what a rain garden was. I had no idea what's a rain garden. Gardens get rain. Then I realized that they were these low places that would capture um, the runoff from my roof. And at the time, the, the gutter downspout fed into a pipe that actually went underground in that area. So I thought, hmm, this shouldn't be too hard to rework. But then I had this concrete mess that was in, 
pervious that shed a lot of water. And I was uh, learned about the um, permeable paper program. And I realized, gosh, if I can replace that with something else um, that's permeable, that would be good for everyone. So um, with help from the um, Alliance and the River Smart program, I uh, got out my colored pencils and started figuring out how to how to do all this in bits and pieces because it was much too big to take on all at once. And so we designed um, permeable pavers to replace the concrete driveway. And instead of a steeping slope, a, a steep slope, I decided to make a two level system with the retaining wall where it was the level of the garage in the front and then the uh, retaining wall and then a lower patio um, beyond that out to the alley. Um, so that, and that needed to go in as once we had finished the garage. And then we hoped that after that, we would have, have the budget and the time to put in the rain garden and then whatever beyond that. So um, here were some of the drawings we submitted and you could see as I was calculating for the rain garden, there were about 850 square feet of my roof dumping that would we would be able to collect the water that would then be diverted into the rain garden. Okay, next. Well, we did manage to get our garage where the, the muddy backyard used to be, but you can see how barren the top of the garage is. And the negative there was that I took, it was a soggy yard, but now I had a, a impermeable rubber membrane on the roof of the garage that was gathering 400 square feet of rain every time it rained. So I had in my, my head the goal ultimately to deal with that. But first things first, we removed the cement driveway and we started on the permeable paver project. And knowing that we were gonna put the rain garden in, we plumbed the downspout that was behind the garage, between the garage and the house in that picture and plumbed it over to the, so that it would ultimately drain into the rain garden. And then at the end of 2019, we had completed the upper level of the permeable pavers and, um, and the new garage. Okay, next slide. Early in 2020, we uh, were set to tackle the second part of it, and um, the pandemic was, was good and bad. It led to a few delays, but ultimately it made it possible to, to focus a little bit more on this project. My, I was originally intending to hold off on the, the rain garden because there was really no budget for it, but my, my intelligent landscaper said, you know, you really don't want to dig all that dirt out of that hole in the ground after you finished your nice um, paver patios. And so he was, he was definitely right about that. So we hauled the dirt out for the future rain garden um, at the beginning of the excavations for the lower permeable paver patio. And you can get a sense of the innards of what a permeable paver patio is all about by, you can see how deeply they dug below the stairs to put in coarse gravel and then pea gravel underneath the pavers. So it's a 400 plus square foot area that soaks up an enormous quantity of rain. So there's there's no water that can fall in that space except for unprecedented quantities in a storm that, that will fill that up and overflow. So it's a, a great reservoir for the storm water that will then slowly soak into the ground. Um, so we were able to complete the permeable pavers but that kind of used up our budget for the spring and we had to take a deep breath and and regroup and hope that we would be able to address the rain garden sooner rather than later. In the meantime, you may recall, go ahead to the next slide, that last summer it was very rainy with a lot of thunderstorms. Um, the benefit of the delay was that it really gave us time to think about the engineering of the rain garden and how to make sure that when we put the rain garden in, it wouldn't overflow onto the nice new pavers and it would actually capture all the water which was coming from most of the downspouts of my house, except for a few in the front. You can see the two white pipes there that were was dumping water. That picture of the hole full of water was really about a half an hour of a, a two inch an hour rainstorm. So I guess the city, in that storm received what seems like a billion gallons of water, according to Jamie's calculations there. It was hundreds of hundreds of gallons, I'm sure, in my own yard. And it gives you a good sense of the scope of the problem that we're dealing with. Um, anyway, we were, last fall, finally able to start with the installation of the rain garden. 
And that involved the, the excavation of a hole had already been done, but then we filled back in with some gravel and then some pea gravel and then the important biosoil, which is mostly very permeable sand and organic matter. And then, and they were careful to cover my new pavers with tarps and so that the debris didn't get on my new pavers and affect them at all. Um, and finally, after a lot of digging and a lot of rain in between, we had a new rain garden. And the picture on the left was really the day after we installed the plants in September of 2019, uh, 2020, I'm sorry, just a year ago. And then the picture on the right is what it looks like today. So it's, it's done well filling in. It will, I'm sure, do a lot more filling in. One of the things that makes me happiest about my rain garden is that it's all native plants that support the local wildlife, um, the bugs and the bees and the birds, the insects. I'm a, I'm a big caterpillar and monarch butterfly person and was thrilled to, to host monarch caterpillars and butterflies last year in my yard. And I'm hoping that the rain garden provides them necessary um, habitat and, and food. Um, so once we finished the rain garden, I turned back to my original desire of doing something with the rooftop of the garage that was pouring uh, 400 square feet of rain into the alley. And our goal was to make some kind of a garden type area. And we learned about the green roof program, rebate program to help us with that. It was actually, Jordan, I think gets blamed for this because I think he was inspecting the rain garden and um, he said to me, oh, did you know there was a rebate for the green roof, for a green roof program? And I said, oh my goodness, no. So that started on my next project. And um, we were able to install this system of these two foot square modules that are planted with plants on top of the rubber membrane roof, alternating with cement pavers. And so about half of the square footage of the, ring, of the rooftop became green material plus the pots of plants that I put there and the other half are cement. So while it looks like, oh gosh, there's still 200 square feet of, of roof that is just the cement that's gonna drain out into the alley, I thought, I bet I can find a clever solution to that. So here's what I did. Next slide. That's what my green roof looks like today. Um, it was grown quite a bit just since it was put in last March. And we're very, very pleased with the space that we've added um, to the main level of our house in terms of both its attractiveness to enjoy as an entertaining space and its utility to uh, nature. Um, down and the right hand side, you can see what my my completed permeable pavers look like. And sorry about the brush pile. I'm working on clearing out some old bushes in my front yard. But if you look on the on the left hand side of the, the picture with the pavers, you'll see the downspout from the garage. And that downspout is not pouring out into the alley. It's feeding into a small trough that's over a garden bed. Um, adjacent to the pavers. And I have a few azaleas planted there and hopes to plant some evergreens there um, this fall. But the, the gist of it is that all of the water that comes off of my roof, the, the remaining half that's not soaked up by the plants up there, gets deposited into the small garden bed there and waters those plants. So we've been very pleased with how things have turned out. Of course, gardens are a work in progress. Um, but we feel it's enhanced our lives and hopefully the lives of the important parts of nature that we live with to have the improvements we've made to the property. Let's go to the last slide. Um, my garden brings me a lot of joy and I'm hoping that my garden provides pollinator habitat, wildlife habitat, and in fact, it does provide monarch um, habitat as well. And so I'm, I'm thrilled to be participating in a program that that produces, that does not let any water escape from my property, but utilizes it all in a way that benefits nature and helps us with our um, stormwater management throughout the city. Thanks very much. Thank you so much to our homeowners and to Jamie and Jordan. We actually have received uh, several questions during the presentation. 
and I will remind everybody to please use the Q&A box if you have any questions. Um, can I invite all of our panelists from today to turn their cameras back on? And we're gonna go ahead and answer some of these questions for you all. Um, and the easiest one that I can answer quickly to Scott is yes, we will make the slides available from this presentation as well as uh, the actual uh, recording. It'll be posted on our website, chesapeakebay.net. And anybody that registered for this uh, webinar today will receive a follow-up email with all of those links. So the first question we have that I think uh, hopefully might be a little easier is what is a bayscape? Okay, I'm gonna throw it out there. Uh, so a basecape really in simple terms is just any type of landscaping that you would install using uh, native plants. So it can be used interchangeably with conservation landscaping. Um, and it's really an easy way to kind of dip your toes in the water of green infrastructure. Um, you know, it, it's not an all or nothing uh, kind of thing. Um, I have probably 60% natives, 40% non-natives in my yard. So, you know, it, it's a good opportunity to just try a few here and there um, to see what you like and see how they do. Thank you, Jamie. Yep. Our next question is from Stephen who asks, within the district, can private landowners reach out to anyone to get green infrastructure technical assistance? For example, DC Water is required to install green infrastructure as part of its consent decree and have developed good technical expertise. Can they provide assistance to private homeowners? I can jump in here as well. Um, and, and I think I answered this question, but uh, to go over in, in Washington, DC, they're really uh, a great avenue to go is contacting the District Department of Energy and Environment. Um, the River Smart Homes program has uh, a lot of resources available for homeowners um, to implement on their properties. Um, you know, through the landscaping, um, uh, well, landscaping and other programs, grant programs, uh, you can install uh, conservation landscaping or basecaping rain gardens, rain barrels, uh, permeable pavers has a rebate program, uh, shade trees are available as well through KC Trees, um, through a grant program uh, and rebate program. Um, Liz used the green roof program. So there's a lot of different options there. So I would definitely recommend going online to DOEE's website. If you just type in River Smart, you should be able to, to find some resources there and connect you there. And a lot of different um, areas have incentive programs. So if you just type in uh, a general like search feature, you may uh, be able to connect. And Rachel put together this great resource page that, that can help get you started as well. Thanks. Next question. I want to plant trees in my front yard, but I live in a one story with solar panels that can't be shaded. Do you have any recommendations for trees that don't grow too tall, but can still provide ecosystem benefits? So I can speak to what's actually in our in our yard, Jordan, since I have three tiers of tree, basically. Um, one of the trees we planted was Southern Magnolia, which obviously can get pretty darn big. Um, however, uh, in the front yard, uh, they're, at least through the River Spark program, uh, they partner with uh, a nonprofit in the city. Um, I, I won't say the name, I'll let others say it if they think it's appropriate, but um, suffice to say, uh, we have a dogwood, so Southern dog, or, you know, a traditional um, white blossom dogwood, um, as well as a river birch. And now I know river birches can get kind of big, but, you know, um, ours is near the rain garden, so it's, you know, super happy. Um, but I think both of those are pretty small and do really, really great in, um, in DC. Um, I don't think uh, a river birch, depending on how close you plant it to the house, would shade out your um, um, solar panels, but certainly a dogwood would not. I can echo those comments that Joey just mentioned that um, dogwood, the native dogwood cornice species are, are great. Another tree that's a small 
an understory tree, we call them. It's a whole category that's smaller than the great big trees. Red buds are great trees. And there's some native species of crab apple. And all three of those provide tremendous benefit to wildlife and especially our host plants for the caterpillars that are food for the butter, food for the birds, and then turn into the beautiful butterflies. So that's just a few, but there are many more. Um, there are native plant websites all over the place. There's a, a Maryland Native Plant Society. There are multiple ones in Virginia and they all have lists of plants, many of which are categorized by whether they're big trees or small trees. And I would encourage the, the listener to seek out those. Um, some Google searches will bring them up quite quickly and you'll realize there are so many beautiful plant native trees to choose from. I'm sure there's some that would work in that setting. Those are great answers. I I'm definitely looking for understory trees. Um, it's kind of a good way to go. You can also look at some of the larger shrubs, um, like the oak leaf hydrangea. That can get up to 12 feet tall, but it's never going to like canopy over. Um, so depending on where you're trying to place it, uh, you can go with something like that that's just going to fill out but not get tall. Um, bayberry is another good example of a shrub that could be quite large without growing over a house. Great, thank you so much all for that great advice. Our next question is uh, has to do with rain gardens. Can a rain garden be successful without being fed by a gutter or a downspout? Take that one. Um, so yes, it can certainly be successful. Um, obviously, the more water you put into a rain garden, the more you know effective it is at capturing water. You do have to size up your rain gardens. But if you just have a small patio and you know that that 100 square feet is draining in one direction, you put a rain garden there, all that water is going to go into your rain garden instead of down your lawn and causing a puddle or out into the alleyway. Um, so you can certainly make a rain garden that's just capturing surface runoff or even just lawn runoff. It doesn't have to be a, a hard surface. I'll just add to that too, just a helpful tip uh, in sizing your rain garden. Uh, just really, really general. Um, we use about a 10% ratio. So if we are trying to capture 500 square feet of uh, water coming into a garden, we'll wanna install a 50 square foot rain garden to handle that volume of water. So 10% um, the size of the rain garden compared to the water we're trying to treat. Um, and again, you know, you, you're, you're really trying to locate it in an area to intercept water. So whether that is along uh, your property to capture water from a downspout, like Jordan said, water running across the property from an alley or, or whatever. Um, Joey's gardens do a really great job of capturing water from a neighboring property uh, and managing it really well. So. Um, you know, again, you can start small and, and build on to that as well. Um, but 10% rule is, is kind of a really rough uh, estimate there. Now, Joey, your second rain garden, that doesn't have a downspout connected to it, right? The, well, the second rain garden does not have a downspout connected to it. That's correct. It does drain off the patio, all of the downspouts from the neighbor's property. Um, but yeah, it's simply uh, some river rock. Um, there are a number of quarries around. If you're dealing with a lot of river rock and you like hauling rock, you can just go get them yourselves, but certainly bags from big box stores work as well. And I just put them at the point where the rain falls off the top of the roof and comes in from the neighboring property and then dug a channel grate that ran perpendicular to the flow of water. Um, and that's where it captures um, the water. Um, and then I just funnel it down to the rain garden through normal corrugated uh, uh, four inch tubing. Great, thank you so much guys for that answer. Let's stick with the rain garden questions. So if any plants in the rain garden get pests or other harmful species on them, would you use chemicals? And if so, are there way, any way to incorporate mitigation for the runoff resulting from fertilizers and chemicals that are used? So I, I can speak to what I use in my garden uh, based on the research I've done, but um, I use a concentrated neem 
oil mixed with uh, rainwater. Um, and I spray that on the leaves. The only native species, literally, that I have issue, well, OK, two. Um, the two native species that I have issues with um, are a certain type of moth that likes to lay its eggs on the underside of the hibiscus. Um, and the neem works great on that. And then there's, I think, a type of aphid, but I could be wrong, that lives and likes to lay its eggs on um, the river birch. Uh, the, the diluted neem oil works great in both those circumstances. Um, otherwise, when it comes to, you know, weeding and pesticides and other things like that. I don't use anything, no Roundup, no anything like that. Um, because mainly at this point, once you do just some hand pulling, uh, the gardens really choke out most other weeds. Um, and the ones they don't choke out, you know, just let them go a little bit. And soon enough, they'll be big enough that you can just grab them by the stalk and pull them out. It's really easy. Um, but that's the beautiful thing about the native species is that they're totally adapted to the pests in this area. Um, so you generally don't have problems with infestations or anything like that. And because it's not a monoculture, you have all of these different plants living in uh, together, you attract a lot of bugs that eat bad bugs. Um, you know, one of the happiest days of my life in this house was seeing dragonflies in my backyard because in DC, I I'll tell you, mosquitoes aren't good. And so those dragonflies take care of that pretty nicely as well. I would certainly second that about the, the benefits of the native plants in reducing the incidence of um, pests and that there shouldn't be any reason to use any pesticides or, or herbicides, something called conservation biological control. Many of the native plants specifically host the larvae and the insects that are the insects that eat the other insects. And so just by planting a rain garden full of native plants and full of a variety and a diversity of native plants, you are helping to minimize the probability of um, unhealthy and insects and, and diseases affecting your garden. You can also kind of jumpstart that process by purchasing um, some of these native insects that will eat the pests. Uh, I used to work at a nursery and you could be bought uh, every spring we'd buy egg sacks of the praying mantis and we just let them go in the nursery and they'd handle the aphids for us. Um, you do want to be careful about where you're buying from to make sure they are actually natives and aren't getting shipped here from the other side of the country but that's always an option too. Yes there's sadly there's Chinese praying mantises that will beat up on the native praying mantises so that that is something to be aware of and learn about but it's a great resource. Thank you guys. To stick with the native plant questions, are there native plants that would work well in heavily shaded areas, perhaps between a house shadow and tall trees? Oh yes. Um, there are a ton of different options uh, depending on your soil conditions. If it's between a house and tall trees, we're hoping for dry soil, not like something wet up against your foundation, um, which usually means ferns, heuchera, um, they're even blooming options. Um, which I'm blanking on as soon as I mention them. But uh, yeah, Joey or Liz, do either of you have uh, some shade in your gardens? Um, Liz, you want to go first? Um, I don't have it. I do have a little bit of shade in my rain garden. And the geranium maculatum is a plant that blooms in fairly a lot of shade. And it's, uh, that actually comes to mind as as one, um, I do have ferns in other shaded areas. Um, there really are a bunch of native shady plants that do work. A ground cover that I've used is called partridge pea, Michella repens, and that's, that's in another part of my yard. Um, there really are many, many native plants that will be successful in all different habitats, including shady ones, and again, directing people to these many resources that are out there from native plant societies and, and government, city governments are putting these together too to encourage people to use them. Yeah, I found that most um, native nurseries in the area um, have wonderful filtering tools on their websites to uh, basically distill out um, exactly the plants that will work based on the inputs you provide. For us, um, Hukra, uh, if I'm pronouncing that, correctly. Um, we have some ostrich ferns. I mean, there's a million fern, native fern varieties, um, you know, um, metaphorically speaking, um, that um, 
you know, have worked really well. Uh, when we had our base gaping installed, I had yet to have built a deck that came off of our back patio. So an area that had um, some like, you know, uh, black eyed Susans and some um, um, moss flocks essentially became shady and those things didn't make it. Um, so again, we just took that as an opportunity um, to uh, explore what options we had. So we put in a bunch of ferns, hookra, and um, I think the one thing that did work from the original planting was, I think the common name is like turtle heads. Um, Delonies. Yeah, yeah. And what's beautiful about the way these gardens work, I think it's worth noting, is, is that everything blooms at a different time of the year. So it starts with the moss flocks and ends with the turtle heads and then everything in between. So there's always something popping off um, and looking beautiful in its, uh, its own two to four week span. Um, so even the shady stuff like the turtle heads, uh, that usually ends out my summer with beauty and, um, and it works great in the shade. Thank you so much, Liz and Joey. We actually, it's 101, but I do have one more question if you guys can take a stab at this before we shut down. And that is, if grants are not available, do you have a list of contractors who may be skilled at installing this type of landscaping? For example, I'm in St. Mary's County, Maryland. I know that DC did maintain a list through the River Smart program. Um, and I'm sure that other counties or the state of Maryland would have similar information. And I bet you guys have access to it at the Alliance. So I have a list of contractors who are willing to work in DC, um, but I don't know, I don't know, Jamie, can you speak to anything out in Maryland? Yeah, I would say, you know, a lot of those lists that you can find for incentive programs, you know, those are contractors participating in those, but they don't just work in those areas. So, for example, you know, Montgomery County has a, a whole list of contractors doing uh, rainscapes installations, um, and there is some crossover between that list, those that work in, in D.C. and other areas throughout Maryland. So definitely check out those lists. Um, from other areas, because most likely those contractors are working in multiple areas. Um, I don't know that we have a comprehensive list for, for larger areas, um, but I can look into what we have uh, and send on to Rachel to share. And for those in DC, I know that next Wednesday, um, for example, I don't know if it's DOEE or if it's the Alliance, um, and I don't really care because anytime anybody wants to look at my gardens, I'm like, yay, but they're coming over to basically have some contractors uh, do some train, you know, get trained on these. So you, you can absolutely find, you know, certified folks um, and for your jurisdiction. Um, that means that they'll be, you know, indoctrinated into these proper practices and these programs. And uh, that's usually a really efficient way of getting it done because uh, they are not starting from scratch and they've, they've all been trained appropriately. So, um, you know, that's, that's, you know, when we did it through the River Smart program, a contractor was given to us um, and it was great and had a wonderful experience with them. So uh, short of those grants, um, there's no shortage of trained up folks out there. Uh, what you're actually talking about, Joey, did, it's CBLP who are coming by. So Chesapeake Bay Landscape Professionals, which there is actually an excellent uh, example of, a group of landscape professionals working in the Chesapeake Bay region. Um, I think they do maintain a list, right, Jamie? Yes, I was just gonna say that you, you took the words out of my mouth, Jordan. Uh, CBLP, Chesapeake Bay landscape professionals are a fantastic resource. They are all trained in green infrastructure practices, both inspecting and some of them do install. And I can certainly send out that list. They do maintain a list of all certified professionals. Um, that would be a great start. Good thinking, Jordan. Well, thank you so much, Jamie, Jordan, Liz, Joey, for taking time out of your day to speak with us all today. We had a lot of great questions. We've all learned a lot. And I just want to remind everybody that this webinar will be available on our website in about 48 hours. So thank you so very much. And I hope everybody has a great day.